there's definitely something that happened to these people that, that was earth shattering and completely has shaken up their lives. If you want access to the best real ghost stories. I think she was afraid that they were going to make her little friend go away. Real accounts of the dead coming back to life. She had a spirit that she had gotten very close with. Real video and images of ghosts. A little boy. Then you need to be an extra podcast person, also known as an EPP. Sign up to be one for only $5 a month at ghostpodcast.com. I stared transfixed as the mist began to gradually become more solid and translucent and to my shock more human in appearance your support is what keeps our show on the air for only five dollars you'll have access to hundreds of epp exclusive episodes updated weekly exclusive video content and more behind me in my kitchen i hear a little girl say are you my daddy where's my daddy keep us on the air and get access to the best ghost stories and more now at ghostpodcast.com and thanks for your support stories online call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com you're about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead this is real ghost stories online that indeed it is and on today's episode of real ghost stories online a school employee tries to research student deaths after a repeated encounter with a ghostly girl. A stranger correctly informs a woman that she is expecting, then strange noises to begin to be heard from the expected baby's nursery. A listener's entire neighborhood seems to be cursed, and one listener poses the question, can you haunt yourself? And shares a story why he believes you can. Those stories and more today on Real Ghost Stories online tony and jenny bruski joining you once again hello how are you i have like i didn't have a cough all day it was like literally in the last two minutes yeah i suddenly like i coughed coming down the stairs Mm -hmm. and now it's just like there it's like tickling i'm sorry it's a tickling cough so i'll try and fill this amount of time here so you can take a nice long drink and and get that out of your way you good now i'm gonna do a little dance over here while you that'll help your cough while you talk yeah. <clears throat> okay. There we go. I should be. Uh, I should be okay. Maybe I can work it into a story or something. And then the ghost said, and then it coughs. That's nice. It'd be great if we had just like a whole archive of of ghost stories involving coughing and ghosts that cough. Then I could just use those on the days where I feel like there's uh, oncoming coughs and just kind of. We'll just make a whole episode. <clears throat> yeah. Just work it in. We'll just call it "Turn Your Head and Cough." It becomes exactly. It becomes a pr- a prop mm-hmm. for the show. So there you go. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Uh, of course, you can also write it on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com, uh, or you can always uh, email me your uh, your story. If you have an audio file on your phone, you want to record it and send it to us, do that. Uh, Tony, T-O-N-Y, at uh, realghoststoriesonline.com. Uh, that, that's, did I say that? Did I say the web? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. It's all it's a blur. Mm-hmm. So. There you go. Uh, our first story today comes into us uh, from Cat, and uh, Cat writes into us today and says, "I worked for an elementary school as a janitor. Every night we closed the school down by six thirty. One night, another janitor and I were uh, locking down the school and preparing for the next day. I saw a student go by my room. I did not hear or go out the uh, back door since it squeaked terribly." The school was silent since all people had left. I went out of the building and asked my friend who taught music if she had a student come there, and she said she was leaving. I thought it was strange, but thought the student went to the back hall where a teacher might have been working late. The next time I saw the student walk by, I saw just the back half of her, which I did not notice before just that it was a person. I called out that we had locked down and As I already knew I had locked uh, the back door, she had no place to go. We'd locked the back halls because she was, uh, there was going to be something at the school auditorium late that night. As I went around the corner to get this young lady, I saw the back half was already locked. Went into the boys' and girls' bathrooms where the other janitors were cleaning, and she had not seen her either. I then went, turned the lights on in the two remaining rooms. She was not there. 
The girl had beautiful long hair. She was wearing saddle shoes and was wearing a plaid pleated skirt. This was in 1997 or 98, so that style was not in. Also, I knew every student, and there was not one of them that had hair all the way down to her butt. I asked a man that was a student there in 1942 if anything had happened at the school, a student dying, etc. He said no, but there was a student that had died in a field that connected to the school long ago. I asked if she had long hair, and he said no. I remembered her very well. This happened at around the same time each night when we were closing the school. I was telling another janitor that had worked there when I was in school, and he said that he too had seen this girl. Freaked the other janitor lady out so bad, she decided to leave school 15 minutes earlier each day just so she'd not meet up with this girl. It did not scare me, since I've seen odd things before of which I would write later. I tried to find if this girl with long hair that had died as a student, but I cannot recall any information. I even asked people if they would recall a student with that long hair dying. I think it's a residual haunting. <clears throat> it may be, and I almost wonder the way she was dressed if she wasn't from after that student, the former student that she talked to from the 40s. Mm -hmm. If maybe this was a ghost of a girl that came after that. Mm -hmm. And... You know, that's going to be real hard to look up, I think. Can you residually haunt a place that you didn't die at? I suppose yeah. because it's it, it, that's not even always a dead person. Sometimes that's just energy replaying itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I wonder in a school, a school-like setting where you, you probably, you know, there's a lot of ways to see things out of the corner of your eye. Mm -hmm. There's hallways and just corridors and this and that. I almost wonder if, if there's more than one thing going on here. If there's just so much energy, so many different things that, I mean, there's a lot of girls with long hair in school, you know? Yeah, and, and Kat saw this figure enough to know it was wearing a plaid skirt, you mm -hmm. know, saddle oxfords. And I think, honestly, it could be, too, that the kid didn't even die in the school or yeah. anywhere near the school, but maybe the school was its happiest place. Yeah. Or if it's residual, maybe it's not even, the person's not even dead. Yeah, could be. Maybe it is just the energy that's mm -hmm. going over and over and over again. Now, schools are interesting places for that. Obviously, there's a lot of energy there. Um, I got a question about schools. Do you remember, like, the big giant gates that would be in the hallways that they, that they close up at night? Yeah, to divide off certain yeah. hallways. Yeah. What was that? Is that a security thing? What was? What is the purpose of of those gates? I've, I've, I've always thought it was security, but I'm just curious. Is that what they it is? They were like accordion gates. Yes. <clears throat> um, I, I honestly always thought it was to keep kids somewhat confined. If it was, I remember them mainly in my high school. Yeah. So sporting events, you've got people roaming the halls and doing stuff and mm -hmm. hiding out. It just confined them into a smaller area easier to monitor people going in and out of the school at least the way our school was set sure. up it was shaped a lot like a spider with six legs yeah. so you had your commons and then you had three yeah. halls off each side so about halfway down those halls they'd have these accordion gates mm -hmm. that would close off so they could keep everybody closer to the commons and and funnel them to either the auditorium or the gym sure so that's what i always thought they were okay that makes sense because you have a lot of like sporting events and activities even the community will use the schools usually for things yeah so if you're at that makes that makes the most sense i think probably just so you don't have children wandering the hallways getting into the rooms with ones left unlocked or whatnot and and ours <clears throat> recessed completely into the brick hallway walls yeah so they were never closed the only time i remember seeing one of those closed when kids were at school mm -hmm. was we had a pipe break and they had to empty out a lot of the rooms and they just didn't want kids even going down there using that bathroom going mm -hmm. to any of those classrooms and they relocated those classes into the commons for like a day yeah and they they blocked it off i remember like trying to it was one time i had forgotten something i needed to go back and get it mm -hmm. and it had, maybe it'd been i don't know a half hour hour after school and some of them were already shut yeah it's like you can get to some lockers at a certain point so it's like you better get your stuff or Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was almost like it was almost like prison bars. Like there's your locker, there's your stuff, and you can't get to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was always I've, I've kind of wondered about that. That talking about schools made me think about those giant gates because I, I can't even think of other places where I've ever even seen those mm -hmm. in use mm -hmm. other than like a high school. Yeah. 
It's like a, a very narrow market for the company that makes those gates. Not really. I mean, high schools. High schools, but I could see other public buildings. You're probably right. There's probably like institution type mm -hmm. settings that, that have those as well. We're just unaware of it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Of course, you can also write in at uh, realghoststoriesonline.com. Next uh, letter, hi, Tony and Jenny. Just discovered your show last week when we took a road trip from Massachusetts to Florida and back. Thanks for helping us pass the long hours of driving. I have many stories to share, but I'll start with this one. It's uh, for my parents. To begin, let me tell you a bit about my great-grandmother. She came to America around the age of 11 and lived in southeastern Massachusetts for the rest of her childhood before marrying my great-grandfather and moving to Brockton. Her name was Marianne McDonald. She was a psychic medium who often helped police in searching for missing children. She even copywrote her own uh, form of tarot cards and the method of using them. I have a copy of the documents and a deck of the cards hand-copied by my mother. She died three years before I was born. One night in 1976, my parents were sleeping. My father awoke in the middle of the night to my mother sitting straight up in bed. He asked her what's wrong, and she proceeds to tell him her grandmother came to say goodbye and that she died. He calmed her and assured her it was just a dream. He was a skeptic after all. Lo and behold, when the sun rose the next morning, the phone rang. It was my grandmother telling, calling to tell my mother that her grandmother did, in fact, pass away that night. From then on, my father was a believer. My mom started bringing me to the spiritualist church in my teens, and I've been attending them since. It's been almost 20 years, and I've had so many experiences there with spirits. It's in Onset, Massachusetts, which was a huge spiritualist camp. In the early 1900s, and people would come from around the world to visit. Not the only remnants of that are the first spiritualist church of Onset and the Onset Wigwam, which is a Native American spiritualist church. The whole area is like a vortex for spirit activity. Thanks for taking the time to read my story. Hope you liked it. You know, could it be people that are more sensitive or can pick up on ghosts when they're living or have any kind of abilities, is there a higher chance of them being ghosts themselves later on? I I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, you know, what, what qualifications it is to become a ghost mm -hmm. or if we all become ghosts or if some people stay, some people move on or, or what the reasoning is. Mike, I had a question similar to that the other day where it was, if you, uh, if you are the ghost, or, or do you have a better... Uh, chance at, at communicating with the living. Yeah, that's true. You know, in the vice versa aspect of things, is it just easier than to reach out and communicate mm -hmm. because you were had that ability on on the other side? I don't know. I just wondered if being <clears throat> open to the other side through mm -hmm. sensitivity or being able to communicate with spirits, if that somehow makes it more open to you when you die. I guess the opportunity, for lack of a better term, to become a ghost. Or not. I don't know if it increases odds or anything like that, but I think it would probably make it easier to understand mm -hmm. if you believed in it uh, sure. to begin with in in uh, in life and had some understanding of it to to suddenly be there. You probably be a lot faster to recognize your situation mm -hmm. than than folks who just kind of brushed off the idea forever and uh, that doesn't exist. Uh, you know. All of a sudden, wait a second, I'm on the other side. That, that can't be because this doesn't exist. If you've already accepted this is something that exists and you're there, you probably get it quicker. Sure. So there's probably less uh, uh, hand-holding that may be needed from the other side to help you uh, cross over or figure out or make your realization mm -hmm. of what uh, what's going on. An interesting question, though, to, to pose to the audience. Uh, Wendy writes into us, this happened back uh, when I was 17, I was a senior in high school, and I lived with my fiancé at the time, now husband. Well, he was 19 and working. We lived in an apartment, and I was pregnant with our first kid, but I don't know. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. One night, we both were craving McDonald's. I went to get it, and I was sitting down waiting for the order. I see a mom and her little girl. An older woman sat next to me, and I remember exactly what she said. I miss that. I remember asking if her kids were all grown, and she told me they'd gone missing. I... Order was called and I was leaving. She said, it's a boy. 
I was confused, and she asked if I was pregnant, but I didn't know why that I was. I took the test to find if I was, but I was only 11 weeks along. How did she know? I got married, and shortly after my niece was having her fourth birthday party at McDonald's, I saw the woman watching kids play. I was around six months at that point. She told me she liked my son the way he was in my stomach. I was a bit weirded out. That night, my husband and I hear a baby cry from Ryan, our son's nursery. So I wanted to check it out because obviously there's no baby yet. The door was locked, but I could hear the woman crying, my baby. It's still so unexplainable to this day. I'm 25 and I'm pregnant with my last child, which is baby number five. But I've never seen that woman again. We've heard crying, but nothing else. And the crying isn't that woman's. I never want to talk to anybody at McDonald's again. <laughs> There's a lot of real friendly folks at McDonald's. My dad just strange. My dad goes there, I think, almost every day, and uh, he talks to these, the same group to, that, to that woman. The same group of people <laughs> every day. It's his. It's his coffee. His coffee clutch. Yeah, and that's like a safe zone. Yeah. I don't know. That's just so weird. And the way her kids went missing, I'd love to know the story there. It's just weird. It is. It's the timing and, and you got to figure it's all somehow connected, mm -hmm. but I don't know. It was that woman a ghost. Was that woman just really, you know, intuitive and had gone through a lot of trauma and didn't know boundaries. I don't know. I kind of think sometimes older people just can tell before you even know. Yeah. And I don't know how that is. I, I had somebody I work with could, he, he told me I was pregnant with heart before I even had the idea to take a test. Uh -huh. And I was like, I was so mad at him. I was like, that's just what I needed to be told I looked like I was pregnant. He's <laughs> like, no, I don't mean it like that. He, he, just, he could just tell. Yeah. I don't know. It, 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 it's a sense thing, I think. Some people have this and some people don't. Yeah. And I suppose if, if you're someone that, that doesn't have uh, a filter as to when this is appropriate or not appropriate to be sure. talking to strangers and saying these things to people. Um, it can come across really creepy. Mm -hmm. um, and then to add in other things into the conversation that, again, if it's a big trauma, not usually something you just bring up with a complete stranger over McNuggets. Yeah. It, you know, <laughs> right. it's, it, it, it's certainly something it, no one's looking down on you for, but it's like, not usually the top of the mm -hmm. the conversation. It's usually maybe by the time you get to the McFlurry, you can talk about the you've trauma. bonded over yeah, the you bonded enough the value meal. But at least at least get through the fries okay. before before we get uh, get there. It just helps everyone feel more comfortable and at ease with each other. Yeah. <laughs> now that we uh, are aware of uh, the order in which to. Uh, to eat the McDonald's food and share our traumatic stories. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. If you like our program, you want to keep us on the air, become an EPP extra podcast person. You sign up to do that at ghostpodcast.com. Get all the bonus episodes of our show. Uh, and uh, it's only five bucks. Uh, five bucks a month is all it is, all that access. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what keeps this thing on the air. So please consider doing that. We greatly appreciate it. Misty writes in, hi, Tony and Jenny. I wrote in previously about the house I grew up in and a few other places I lived in up until I got married. My story was added as an EPP story called Don't Turn Around. Incidentally, also an Ace of Bass song, which Tony will now sing. I will survive without you. you get it out of your system? <laughs> I guess so. Okay. So it's, I'm doing the full instrumentation. We'll do Kenny G in the next story. Uh, I love the graphics y'all used. I wasn't, uh, it, it uh, wasn't fun to uh, live throughout, uh, but makes for a good story. Jenny said she thought I was probably a haunted person and she was dead on. I felt something dark was following me. I had a cleansing done, but by the time I met my husband, and have not felt this since, uh, felt the following since. That being said, I do see and hear things from time to time in various places because I know I am sensitive, but it has never been out of scale. I've never been to the scale that it was. My husband and I hadn't had any real issues with the paranormal until we bought our first home, which we had built. As far as I know, the land the house was built on was just farmland, subdivided up for housing, but I've never researched to find out for sure. 
Our house was about the fifth or sixth one built in the neighborhood, so we pretty much knew everyone already living there and most of the new people having homes built and moving in. It was a lot of fun in the, be in the beginning, but that didn't last for long. The next several years went from being fun to an absolute nightmare that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Now, looking back, I truly believe the neighborhood was cursed and there's something very bad there. My earliest recollection of anything out of the ordinary was when our youngest child, who was four at the time, was supposed to be taking a nap. She didn't take, or she didn't like taking naps in her room and always wanted to take a nap in my room, so I used to let her. The layout of the house is somewhat important, so try to picture the front door opens into an entryway with the kitchen and living room straight ahead. The master bedroom was to the right of the entryway, and the kids' bedrooms were to the left of the entryway. The kitchen and living room were a straight shot to the back of the house, so you walked through the entryway and then into the kitchen and ended up in the living room. This is important so you can understand from just about anywhere in the kitchen or living room you could see the entryway and front door. Well, I was sitting at the kitchen table talking with my mom on the phone and out of my peripheral vision I saw a little girl with two ponytails in her hair run through the edge of the kitchen from my bedroom to the kids' bedrooms. It didn't dawn on me at the time my daughter didn't have ponytails in her hair. I wasn't thinking clearly. I just thought, oh, she's up and I needed to put her back down for her nap. With my mom still on the phone, I got up and walked into the kids' side of the house, into my daughter's bedroom, expecting to see her playing with her toys, only to find the room empty. I thought that was weird and checked the other bedrooms and nothing. I walked back across the house to my bedroom. And there she was, sound asleep in my bed. She'd never left. My other kids were at school and she and I were the only ones home. My mom said to me, you need to cleanse that house soon. She was worried and so was I. Well, I did cleanse the house and nothing really happened for the next several years. I don't know if the cleansing wore off or something happened to remove it. Or maybe I was just fooled and it never really worked in the first place. I have no idea. Things seemed to be going along without much cause for concern until one day when I was doing laundry. I just folded some sheets and was headed to the linen closet in the kids' hallway on the other side of the house. I just stepped out of the entryway into the hallway and something that looked like my oldest daughter ran past me down the hallway so fast it almost knocked me down. I was very angry because I really thought it was my daughter who's not allowed to run in the house and she almost knocked me down while I'm carrying an armload of bed sheets. I marched into her bedroom where I had seen her go only to find it empty. Again, all the other rooms were empty on this side of the house. The only way past me was a doorway behind me that led to the entryway which I had been stepping through. I felt very uneasy and put the sheets away and went to find my kids who were in my bedroom playing a board game on the floor. I already knew the answer, but asked my daughter anyway if she had just run past me in the hallway. She looked at me like I was crazy and said no. Again, I cleansed the house, but it didn't do any good this time. Little things continued to happen here and there, too. Too many to recount, so I only hit the freakiest ones. I was in the shower in my master bedroom with the door shut and my kids were watching TV in the bedroom. I got dressed and opened the door to see the ceiling fan and light were both on. It was the middle of the day, so I asked my daughter to please turn off the light, but not the fan. We had a remote mounted on the wall near the bed, so all she would need to do was lean across and hit the light button. I closed the door and dried my hair and finished getting ready. When I again opened the bathroom door, the fan and light were both off. I was a little annoyed because I had told her not to turn the fan off. It was summer, and I didn't want my room to get hot. I asked her why she turned off both off and... She looked at me like she had no idea what I was talking about. All my kids looked up at the ceiling fan and none of them had realized it had turned off because they were so involved in what they were watching. I walked across the room and realized the switch on the wall had been turned off. The switch was a good distance away from my kids who hadn't moved the entire time. Something had flipped it off. I'm not sure how much longer down the road the next incident happened, but one evening I was sitting in my oldest daughter's room, talking with her about something. I was sitting on her bed, and she was sitting across from me at her desk. Above her desk, I had hung a cork board so she could hang things on it with thumbtacks. She had a postcard stuck in the corner of it that was not tacked on. As we were talking, the postcard shot across the room and whacked the wall really hard. There was some real force put into that, this to make it hit the wall that hard. 
did not fall off or get bumped because we were both sitting and not moving. We both just stopped and stared. I mean, what do you do in that situation? I didn't want to scare my daughter, so I just picked it up and put it back as nonchalantly as I could. Another incident that happened was one night my oldest daughter sat at about 1.30 in the morning. I opened her door, walked into her room, looked at her, walked back out, closing the door behind me like I'd just been in there to check on her. At the time, I just agreed it was me so as not to scare her. I knew for a fact it wasn't me because I'm not up at those late hours on nights and I know I have to be up for work the next day. Also, my husband worked late hours at the time and it was his habit to come home from work and relax watching TV in the living room before coming to bed, which is where he was that night. I would have had to walk through his field of vision across the entryway from our side of the house into the kid's side of the house and he didn't remember ever seeing me on that night when this happened. I didn't find out until we had moved many years later, but my oldest daughter said she used to hear bangs at her bedroom door at night like someone was falling into it. She slept with her door closed every night. Well, one night she heard something at the door like scratching sounds and she thought maybe it was our cat, but she had a bad feeling, so she didn't open the door. Instead, she got down on the floor and looked under the door. The light from the bathroom down the hall illuminated enough of the hall that should She'd be able to see most of the way down the hole. There was a shadow on her door like someone was standing in front of it. But there was nothing in the hall to make the shadow. The entire time she continued to hear the noise. She was scared, so she got back into bed and stayed there until morning. Now for the reason I feel the neighborhood was cursed. And keep in mind, this was all before the big financial crisis. Everyone who moved into that neighborhood experienced either financial problems, break-ins, or divorce. I know to some extent that is normal part of life, but this was off the charts weird to the point several of us in the neighborhood took notice. This was a very nice neighborhood in a nice part of town. There are at least 12 break-ins that I know of over a period of just a few years. And a mother and her daughter were held at gunpoint along the walking trail that circled the neighborhood which was out in the open. During the time my husband and I were waiting for our home to be built, our neighbor to our right died unexpectedly and left his wife and daughter behind. The wife could not afford the house payments on her own, and the bank took the house about three months after we moved in. It was very sad. Our neighbors on the left of us got divorced a few years after we moved in. The wife was the one who made all the money, so kept the house after the divorce. About a year later, she lost her job and had some really bad financial problems, and the bank foreclosed on the house. The three houses behind us, all three couples divorced. The house directly across the street from us, the couple who moved in, had been married for over 20 years. They got along great. Our kids played with their kids. They were very nice. About two years after moving in, we would hear yelling outside occasionally. It would be them fighting and screaming curse words at each other. They both made really good money, but started to have financial problems and ended up losing their home to the bank like the others had. After they moved, my husband and I went to visit them and they told us they were getting along again. The fighting had stopped. The finances were improving. It was like night and day for them. The craziness doesn't stop there, though. The couple two doors down from us started to fight and eventually got divorced after over 20 years of marriage. The house next to us, where the guy died, sat empty for almost two years, and it was a new house in a new neighborhood, so that always struck me as weird. People would come look at it, but no one ever wanted to buy it. Anyway, a young couple bought it. They were newly married and just adored each other, and we started noticing them fighting in the driveway sometimes. My first thought was, oh no, here we go again. During all this time, my husband and I stopped getting along to the point he started drinking heavily and we came very close to divorcing. We also started to have severe financial problems and ended up losing our home to the bank. We moved to a different house in another city and after we moved in, it was like we could breathe again. I hadn't noticed how oppressed we all were until my oldest daughter and I were talking about it one evening. She said she used to be afraid to express happiness while living in the old house because however much she was happy, something equally bad would happen to make it that make her that much more unhappy. I told her I'd felt that too. My husband and I get along and our finances are much better. Life seems good again. And we are all happy for that. The end. I think something has happened on the land where that neighborhood is. Yeah. I think there's like people in the ground or something. That or, you know, I don't know where it took place. Mm -hmm. Battlefield. I don't know. Yeah, there's 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 some very bad energy that's going on there, mm -hmm. uh, and and something 
something I think probably manipulating things and probably just beyond beyond just oh we shouldn't have built here yeah it, it seems very very you know maniacal and it's not affecting just sensitive people because I can't imagine everybody yeah. that's being affected in that neighborhood is just just sensitive yeah no yeah. that's that's very very creepy like to, that's one of those things where you just like to know <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> where it is yeah. it's like oh take that off the ever list mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so anybody listening about, then you, you really can't do that but uh that is uh that is very creepy thank you for sharing that uh that experience with us hi tony and jenny my name is jess and i'm writing from new hampshire just wanted to share a quick story that happened to me last summer i was driving home from work one night it was dark and i was exhausted i pulled up to a red light at the intersection and waited for the light to turn green now, normally, whenever I'm about to go through an intersection, I look both ways, whether the light just turns green or it's been green as I approach it, just to be safe. Tonight, however, I just wanted to get home and wasn't being careful, so when the light turned green, I slowly moved my foot from the brake to the gas and inched forward. It was when my back tires were coming close to the stop line that I heard a voice pop into my head. It wasn't someone else's voice, it definitely sounded like my own inner voice, but it didn't feel like it belonged to me. It interrupted my own thoughts. It was loud, urgent, and persistent. Look to your left, look to your left. And so I did. And they're coming from the road on the left too long after they got to the red light was a truck blowing through the intersection. They're probably going about 35, 40 miles an hour. So of course I slam on the brakes and honk to which they honk back for whatever reason. Like I said, I didn't just gun it when the light turned green. So if anyone was going to run the light last second, they would have before I even let off the brakes. So I wasn't just being careless. Anyway, the rest of my ride home, I was freaked out. I could have just been in the very bad accident. I truly felt like someone was looking out for me that night. Thanks for reading. Love the show and how you connect with your listeners through social media. I just signed up to be an EPP and love the seeing ghost episodes. Can't wait to see more. Take care. You know, and that makes you wonder, is it her inner voice since it sounded like herself mm -hmm. and her instinct just knew not to do that or was something using her voice? I think in times like that, it, it, it's almost there's something intervening mm -hmm. using the voice, probably. Yeah. But there's something getting that message to her to, uh, uh, to to know to do something out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that uh, that story. Speaking of uh, of seeing ghosts beginning to work on putting together our next episode of that and a really good uh, image was sent into us uh through uh through facebook one of our listeners sent it to us and it's uh it's it's just it's some people taking a selfie i believe at a black sabbath concert mm -hmm. and it looks like a normal picture and then off in the distance just a little way in the, the people behind the, the in the selfie there's some other folks and then this really weird creepy no eyed figure just kind of like inched between people and it 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 is creepy as hell <laughs> and it, it it doesn't look like a photoshopped anything it looks like i mean you really you, you look like oh god what is that mm -hmm. and I, I i was trying to figure it out earlier like well could it be this there just doesn't seem to be any sort of real logical explanation other than there's something there that uh Either that's a one of the creepiest looking people I've ever seen in my life, and their eyes glow, uh, or uh, or there's something that showed up in that picture that probably the people that were in that picture did not see. Yeah. So uh, it's creepy. It'll be in the next episode of Seeing Ghosts when that comes out. Don't have an exact date on that, but it'll be in the coming weeks. Uh, for now, though, there's about uh, ten episodes of Seeing Ghosts up there for your viewing pleasure on our uh, ghostpodcast.com website. Get access to all those episodes uh, when you're an EPP, an extra podcast person. So check that out there at uh, ghostpodcast.com. Got a handful of other good images uh, as well and some video stuff that's been sent in uh, over the last month. I just got to go back and compile it and sure. put it together and, and do the episode. But uh, that one, it was just, uh, it's one of the better. Top five ghost pictures? <laughs> I'd say so. I mean, it's creepy. And it's not one that you know others have seen. I think it's it was a private photo. This person had taken it, or, or their their I believe it was their ex wife took it. Um, so it, I don't believe it's made the rounds anywhere. But um, 
Yeah. It'll be uh, it'll be a creepy one to see when, once uh, once we get it up there. So don't miss that uh, when you're an EPP at ghostpodcast.com. Uh, next letter. Hi, Tony and Jenny. It's uh, Candace from Minnesota again. I called in a couple weeks ago, but I was driving and I'm not sure that the quality was the best. So I thought that I'd write in instead. Found you a few months ago and have since gotten most of my husband's family addicted to your show. We are EPPs and my husband and I listen to you together uh, every evening and we love it. Thank you for all the hard work you put into the show. We love your dynamic and think you're both uh, great. Here's a little backstory. My maternal great-grandmother, Curtie, uh, was an extremely stubborn, no-nonsense Christian woman from New York. She was 85 when she was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer in November of 2010. By the beginning of January 2011, it had spread to her bones and lymph nodes, and she was put in hospice care, unable to care for herself any longer. She moved in with my maternal grandma, Jo Ann. At the time, I was living in Florida with my mom and my newborn son. I decided to move up to Minnesota for, to help my great-grandma. So at the end of January of 2011, my son and I moved to Minnesota, and from then on, I helped my grandma care for my great-grandma several days a week. Now, I love body modification and have tons of tattoos. One of my tattoos is a vine of flowers going up my side to my rib cage. The vine consists of two uh, gardenias and uh, uh, and something and a lily. Uh, my great grandma and grandma's favorite flowers are both gardenias, while my mom's is a uh, calla lily. On March 25th of 2011, I went to a tattoo shop and had started this tattoo. The part that was done on this day was the first gardenia on my side, my grandma, uh, Curtie's flower. I left the tattoo shop that afternoon and ran to the dollar store to get some cat litter for Grandma Curtie's cat. The plan being to drive back to Grandma Joe's house to spend the entire evening with her and great Grandma Curtie. I was at the dollar store. I got a call from Grandma Joe that Grandma Curtie had passed away. She died while I was getting the tattoo for her. My next experience was not until November of 2013. My boyfriend, now husband, Zach, moved in with me and my son. We were talking about my great-grandma one day, and my boyfriend asked if he thought my great-grandma would have liked him. I told him, yes, I did. They both had a love of animals and gardening, and I think she'd be very happy that he stepped up and became my son's father. I joked that the only thing that she would have found issue with was the fact that we were uh, intimate before marriage since she was Christian and all. Later that evening, we were in bed and getting intimate when suddenly there was a huge crash in my closet. We jumped up to investigate and found that the large shelf that was in my closet was now on the floor. Screws and all ripped right out of the wall. I took that as a sign that she did indeed find offense in our premarital encounters. She had a motion sensor light in the backyard that would come on whenever someone walked through the yard. During the summer of 2014, we were having a bonfire in the backyard, and because we were all sitting out there and moving around, she, the motion sensing light was on. All of a sudden, the light started blinking on and off. It blinked on and off for about five minutes. Finally annoyed, I said, Grandma, please stop messing with the light, and just then the light went off. It never turned on again. I don't know for sure that any of those instances were grandma, but I don't believe in coincidences. I never got a bad or uneasy feeling about it. I just thought they were very interesting. Those are all the cases that I can attribute to my grandma. However, we just recently had an experience on my husband's side as well that I'd like to tell you about. Around Thanksgiving of 2016, my husband's grandpa Ed was admitted to a nursing home, originally on the, promise, uh, uh, the premise of doing rehab to gain his strength back. He went downhill pretty quickly, though, and by mid-December of 2016, he was in hospice. Our family went to visit him in December 26 of 2016, and while we were in the room, the air was heavy, and I had that overwhelming feeling that Grandpa was going to die on my birthday, December 28th. I also felt very strongly that Grandpa wanted me to take his shirts and make pillows out of them for his kids and grandkids, despite him not saying anything about it. On our way home, I mentioned both of my feelings to my husband, and he asked me how I knew I said that I didn't know. Fast forward to the morning of December 28th. I was dreaming. I'm sitting at my desk at work. Now, when I'm at work in real life, I'm wearing headphones and I'm listening to your podcast. The same was true in my dream. I could sense, though, that someone was standing behind me. When I turned around, I saw a small-figured brunette woman standing there. I told her, oh, honey, if you need me, just tap my shoulder to get my attention. She smiled. When she was about to open her mouth to speak... I was suddenly woken up by a call to my cell phone. It was my mother-in-law calling to let us know that Grandpa had died. 
Later that day, we went to my mother-in-law's house to comfort her, and I told her about my dream. She wasn't surprised and told me that her grandma comes to her regularly in her dreams and pointed to a picture of her on the wall. It was a woman from my dream. She also said that Grandpa had requested that his items be divided up between his grandkids, but he specifically wanted his clothes to go to my husband. Too weird to not be paranormal. Is it weirder that I find it comforting? Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for reading. A lot of premonition there. Mm-hmm. And I always lump that into paranormal. I do, too. I mean, I think it all kind of ties into it. It's it's uh, almost... Uh, when you have the premonitions, if you will, and the person is still alive and, mm -hmm. and you're kind of getting them, is it that person that's communicating to you? Is it you telling something about the future? Is the, the, the person who's going to die, are they involved in that? I don't know. Process? I don't know. I think if they've already died and then visited you and you know they're going, you're going to get that call. Mm -hmm. I think that's more of a ghostly encounter, but it seems like she just seems to know before it happens. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that story. Thank you for sharing those experiences with us. Uh, another letter here. Dear, uh, dear Tony and Jenny, is it possible to haunt yourself? The story takes place many years ago, it seems. Way back in the late 70s. I was about six or seven years old when we were living in a small apartment above a shop. Uh, green grocer, actually, but that isn't important in this story. But I do have another where I flooded the shop below by leaving one of our bath taps running when I was only a kid. The way the apartment was arranged, my bedroom was at one end of the passage and at the other end was a linen cupboard. While I lay in bed on my left side and the door open, the linen cupboard was as far as I could see, probably only about five or six yards away. One night I woke up and just happened to be looking at the linen cupboard when the door opened and I saw a figure sitting below the bottom shelf looking straight at me. There wasn't much space in there, so... He was cramped against the wall of the cupboard with his knees pulled up to his chest and his hands clasping as if to keep his legs from straightening out. Not that there was the room to do this. He turned his head to look at me, smiled, waved, and the door closed on him again. Since then, this memory has often popped into my head, and I remember as if it were yesterday. Roll on a few years to May 2nd, 1997. I remember the date as if I were... I was feeling a little rough after being up all night listening to the British general election results in which Tony Blair won, I had somehow made my way to S Sunderland University, where I was studying at the time. It was a really warm day, and we were all feeling, after the election, results, so we cut classes. We sat out on the grass in front of the uni building and running back and forth to the student union bar for cheap beer. For some reason, I had a compact camera in my pocket, a real film one, as this was the days before smartphones, and it was passed around taking pictures of us all. Later, I got the film developed and got a shock when I saw the photograph of me. I was exactly like the man I saw in the linen cupboard 20-ish years ago, even down to the black framed glasses I was wearing. The sci-fi nerd in me kicked in, and I wondered if I was in a time loop and destined sometime soon to go back to the old apartment and climb into the cupboard so I could look out and see my younger self in bed, but this didn't happen, and now I am no longer that fresh-faced youth of 97. Love the show. I listen every night in bed with my phone under my pillow. Yours, Paul Mabley. I think so. I think it might be possible. And the reason I think that is because <laughs> we've had stories where people have passed down in their generations i had this you know i think it was a snowstorm a kid got lost in mm -hmm. and this strange looking fellow dressed really weird came and, and guided him where he needed to be yeah and it ended up later on they put it all together it was somebody who hadn't even been born yet who died in world war ii like 30 years later mm -hmm. you know and it was just it, it's kind of a a jumping time type thing not so much a dead ghost thing yeah but going back in time and and visiting either yourself or a loved one or something like that it's uh, i think certainly possible um i think it's it's unexplainable obviously you know how it happens why it happens i think sometimes the reasoning varies 
Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the fact that, that we've had stories of people, essentially living people being ghosts to other people, mm-hmm. uh, it's just another thing we can add to the, uh, the list of ghosts. Yeah. Uh, or the family tree of ghosts, and that just makes it that much more confusing and uh, that much more uh, that we don't understand about anything that we're talking about on this show. That's true. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, it's like you, know, you think you kind of got something figured out. Nope. Add this one to the mix, too. So it's always um, an interesting thing where someone says, well, you must be uh, you, you must uh, you know, be an expert on ghosts. I wouldn't no. say expert. No, I, I would say I have a lot of, of knowledge just based on stories. So I have I have a lot of understanding. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think expert implies that you know, uh, like the answers to what's going on. No. And, in, and as far as the answers, yeah, you got none of that. But uh, you know, just just from hearing the stories, um, I'm informed mm-hmm. on a lot of stories. I think that would be the the operative uh, yeah. word of it. So. Uh, thank you for that uh, that experience. We do greatly appreciate it. And uh, there you go. That wraps up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. Thank you for listening. Thanks uh, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate that. Follow us on social media. Facebook, uh, Twitter, we're at uh, Ghost Story Radio. Instagram, Ghost Podcast. And Snapchat is at Ghost Podcast as well. So follow us there for uh, interaction uh, outside of the, um, the podcast. Uh, if you like the show, also become an EPP, Extra Podcast Person. Keep us on the air. Five bucks a month is all we ask, uh, and you uh, can get all the uh, the goodness that is the EPP episodes at ghostpodcast.com. Until next time, for Jenny Brewski, I'm Tony Brewski. Thank you for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.